Cuba has a planned economy dominated by state-run enterprises. Most industries are owned and operated by the government and most of the labor force is employed by the state. Following the fall of the Soviet Union, the Communist Party encouraged the formation of worker cooperatives and self-employment. In the year 2000, public sector employment was 76% and private sector employment, mainly composed of self-employment, was 23% compared to the 1981 ratio of 91% to 8%. Investment is restricted and requires approval by the government. The government sets most prices and rations goods to citizens. In 2016, Cuba ranked 68th out of 182 countries with a Human Development Index of 0.775, much higher than its GDP per capita rank 95th. In 2012, the country's public debt was 35.3% of GDP, inflation (CDP) was 5.5%, and GDP growth was 3%. Housing and transportation costs are low. Cubans receive government subsidized education, health care, and food subsidies. The country achieved a more even distribution of income since the Cuban Revolution, which was followed by an economic embargo by the United States. Following the collapse of the Soviet Union, Cuba's GDP declined by 33% between 1990 and 1993, partially due to loss of Soviet subsidies and to a crash in sugar prices in the early 1990s. Cuba retains high levels of health care and education. History Before the revolution Although Cuba belonged to the high-income countries of Latin America since the 1870s, income inequality was high, accompanied by capital outflows to foreign investors. The country's economy had grown rapidly in the early part of the century, fueled by the sale of sugar to the United States. Prior to the Cuban Revolution, Cuba ranked fifth in the hemisphere in per capita income, third in life expectancy, second in per capita ownership of automobiles and telephones, first in the number of television sets per inhabitant. Its income per capita in 1929 was reportedly 41% of the U.S., thus higher than in Mississippi and South Carolina. Its proximity to the United States made it a familiar holiday destination for wealthy Americans. Their visits for gambling, horse racing and golfing made tourism an important economic sector. Tourism magazine Cabaret Quarterly described Havana as a mistress of pleasure, the lush and opulent goddess of delights. According to Perez, Havana was then what Las Vegas has become. Cuban dictator Fulgencio Batista had plans to line the Malecon, Havana's famous walkway by the water, with hotels and casinos to attract even more tourists. Today Hotel Havana Riviera is the only hotel that was built before the revolutionary government took control. Cuba had a one-crop economy, sugarcane, whose domestic market was constricted. Its population was characterized by chronic unemployment and deep poverty. United States monopolies like Bethlehem Steel Corporation and Spire gained control over valuable national resources. The banks and the country's entire financial system, all electric power production and the majority of industry was dominated by U.S. companies. U.S. monopolies owned 25% of the best land in Cuba. More than 80% of farmland was owned by sugar and livestock raising large landowners. 90% of the country's raw sugar and tobacco exports was exported to the U.S. in 1956. U.S. owned companies controlled 90% of the telephone and electric services, about 50% in public service railways, and roughly 40% in raw sugar production, according to a report published by the Department of Commerce. The gains from these investments were reaped by American businessmen, leading to discontent among the Cuban people. In the 1950s, most Cuban children were not in school. 87% of urban homes had electricity, but only 10% of rural homes did. 
Only 15% of rural homes had running water. Nearly half the rural population was illiterate as was about 25% of the total population. Poverty and unemployment in rural areas triggered migration to Havana. More than 40% of the Cuban workforce in 1958 were either underemployed or unemployed. Topic: <inaudible> Cuban Revolution. On March 3, 1959, Fidel Castro seized control of the Cuban Telephone Company, which was a subsidiary of the International Telephone and Telecommunications Corporation. This was the first of many nationalizations made by the new government. The assets seized totaled nine billion United States dollars. After the 1959 revolution, citizens were not required to pay a personal income tax; their salaries being regarded as net of any taxes. The government also began to subsidize health care and education for all citizens. This action created strong national support for the new revolutionary government. After the USSR and Cuba re established their diplomatic relations in May 1960, the USSR began to buy Cuban sugar in exchange for oil. When oil refineries like Shell, Texaco, and Esso refused to refine Soviet oil, Castro nationalized that industry as well, taking over the refineries on the island. Days later, in response, the United States cut the Cuban sugar quota completely. Eisenhower was quoted saying, this action amounts to economic sanctions against Cuba. Now we must look ahead to other moves, economic, diplomatic, and strategic. On February 7, 1962, Kennedy expanded the United States embargo to cover almost all U.S. imports. In 1970, Fidel Castro attempted to motivate the Cuban people to harvest 10 million tons of sugar, in Spanish known as la zafra, in order to increase their exports and grow their economy. With the help of the majority of the Cuban population, the country was able to produce 7.56 million tons of sugar. In July 1970, after the harvest was over, Castro took responsibility for the failure and later that same year he blamed the sugar industry minister saying those technocrats, geniuses, super scientists assured me that they knew what to do in order to produce the 10 million tons. But it was proven, first, that they did not know how to do it and, second, that they exploited the rest of the economy by receiving large amounts of resources, while there are factories that could have improved with a better distribution of those resources that were allocated to the 10 million ton plan. During the revolutionary period, Cuba was one of the few developing countries to provide foreign aid to other countries. Foreign aid began with the construction of six hospitals in Peru in the early 1970s. It expanded later in the 1970s to the point where some 8,000 Cubans worked in overseas assignments. Cubans built housing, roads, airports, schools and other facilities in Angola, Ethiopia, Laos, Guinea, Tanzania and other countries. By the end of 1985, 35,000 Cuban workers had helped build projects in some 20 Asian, African, and Latin American countries. For Nicaragua in 1982, Cuba pledged to provide over $130 million worth of agricultural and machinery equipment, as well as some 4,000 technicians, doctors, and teachers. In 1986, Cuba defaulted on its $10.9 billion debt to the Paris Club. In 1987 Cuba stopped making payments on that debt. In 2002 Cuba defaulted on $750 million in Japanese loans, although the Soviet Union offered subsidies to Cuba beginning shortly after the revolution. Comparative economic data from 1989 showed that the amount of Soviet aid was in line with the amount of Western aid to other Latin American countries. Topic. Special period The Cuban gross domestic product declined at least 35% between 1989 and 1993 due to the loss of 80% of its trading partners and Soviet subsidies. This loss of subsidies coincided with a collapse in world sugar prices. 
Sugar had done well from 1985 to 90 and crashed precipitously in 1990–91 and did not recover for five years. Cuba had been insulated from world sugar prices by Soviet price guarantees. However, the Cuban economy began to boost again following a rapid improvement in trade and diplomatic relations between Cuba and Venezuela following the election of Hugo Chávez in Venezuela in 1998, who became Cuba's most important trading partner and diplomatic ally. This era was referred to as the "...special period in peacetime", later shortened to "...special period." A Canadian Medical Association journal paper claimed that, "...the famine in Cuba during the special period was caused by political and economic factors similar to the ones that caused a famine in North Korea in the mid-1990s, on the grounds that both countries were run by authoritarian regimes that denied ordinary people the food to which they were entitled to when the public food distribution collapsed and priority was given to the elite class and the military. Other reports painted an equally dismal picture, describing Cubans having to resort to eating anything they could find, from Havana Zoo animals to domestic cats. But although the collapse of centrally planned economies in the Soviet Union and other countries of the Eastern Bloc subjected Cuba to severe economic difficulties, which led to a drop in calories per day from 3,052 in 1989 to 2,600 in 2006, mortality rates were not strongly affected thanks to the priority given on maintaining a social safety net. The government undertook several reforms to stem excess liquidity, increase labor incentives, and alleviate serious shortages of food, consumer goods and services. To alleviate the economic crisis, the government introduced a few market-oriented reforms including opening to tourism, allowing foreign investment, legalizing the US dollar and authorizing self-employment for some 150 occupations. This policy was later partially reversed, so that while the US dollar is no longer accepted in businesses, it remains legal for Cubans to hold the currency. These measures resulted in modest economic growth. The liberalized agricultural markets introduced in October 1994, at which state and private farmers sell above quota production at free market prices, broadened legal consumption alternatives and reduced black market prices. Government efforts to lower subsidies to unprofitable enterprises and to shrink the money supply caused the semi-official exchange rate for the Cuban peso to move from a peak of 120 to the dollar in the summer of 1994 to 21 to the dollar by year-end 1999. The drop in GDP apparently halted in 1994, when Cuba reported 0.7% growth, followed by increases of 2.5% in 1995 and 7.8% in 1996. Growth slowed again in 1997 and 1998 to 2.5% and 1.2% respectively. One of the key reasons given was the failure to notice that sugar production had become uneconomic. Reflecting on the special period Cuban president Fidel Castro later admitted that many mistakes had been made. The country had many economists and it is not my intention to criticize them, but I would like to ask why we hadn't discovered earlier that maintaining our levels of sugar production would be impossible. The Soviet Union had collapsed, oil was costing $40 a barrel, sugar prices were at basement levels, so why did we not rationalize the industry? Living conditions in 1999 remained well below the 1989 level. Recovery <inaudible> 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 Due to the continued growth of tourism, growth began in 1999 with a 6.2% increase in GDP. Growth then picked up, with a growth in GDP of 11.8% in 2005 according to government figures. In 2007 the Cuban economy grew by 7.5%, higher than the Latin American average. 
Accordingly, the cumulative growth in GDP since 2004 stood at 42.5%. However, from 1996, the state started to impose income taxes on self employed Cubans. Cuba ranked third in the region in 1958 in GDP per capita, surpassed only by Venezuela and Uruguay. It had descended to 9th, 11th or 12th place in the region by 2007. Cuban social indicators suffered less. Every year the United Nations holds a vote asking countries to choose if the United States is justified in their economic embargo against Cuba and whether it should be lifted. 2016 was the first year that the United States abstained from the vote, rather than voting no. Since 1992 the U.S. and Israel have constantly voted against the resolution, occasionally supported by the Marshall Islands, Palau, Uzbekistan, Albania and Romania. Post-Fidel reforms Either we change course or we sink. In 2011, the new economic reforms were introduced, effectively creating a new economic system, referred by some as the new Cuban economy. Since then, over 400,000 Cubans have signed up to be entrepreneurs. As of 2012, the government lists 181 official jobs no longer under their control such as taxi driver, construction worker and shopkeeper. Workers may purchase licenses to work as a mule driver, palm tree trimmer, well digger, button covered and dandy — gentleman in traditional elegant white suit and hat. Despite these openings Cuba maintains nationalized companies for the distribution of all essential amenities water, power, and other essential services to ensure a healthy population education, health care. Imports were double exports and doctors earned £15 per month. Families supplement incomes with extra jobs. After 2000, half the country's sugar mills closed and tourists now ride factory steam locomotives. More than 150,000 farmers lease land from the government for bonus crops. Before, homeowners were allowed to swap properties, legalized buying and selling then created a real estate boom. In 2012 a Havana fast food burger pizza restaurant, La Pachanga, started in the owner's home, serves 1,000 meals on a Saturday at £3, the weekly government wage. In 2008, Raul Castro's administration hinted that the purchase of computers, DVD players and microwaves would become legal. However, monthly wages remain less than 20 US dollars. Mobile phones, which had been restricted to Cubans working for foreign companies and government officials, were legalized in 2008. In 2010, Fidel Castro, in agreement with Raúl Castro's reformist sentiment, admitted that the Cuban model based on the old Soviet model of centralized planning was no longer sustainable. They encouraged the creation of a cooperative variant of socialism where the state plays a less active role in the economy and the formation of worker-owned cooperatives and self-employment enterprises. To remedy Cuba's economic structural distortions and inefficiencies, the Sixth Congress approved expansion of the internal market and access to global markets on April 18, 2011. The comprehensive list of changes is expenditure adjustments education, healthcare, sports, culture change in the structure of employment, reduce inflated payrolls and increase work in the non-state sector legalizing of 201 different personal business licenses fallow state land in Ushafrakt leased to residents incentives for non-state employment, as a relaunch of self-employment Proposals for creation of non-agricultural cooperatives Legalization of sale and private ownership of homes and cars Greater autonomy for state firms Search for food self-sufficiency, gradual elimination of universal rationing and change to targeting poorest population Possibility to rent state-run enterprises to self-employed, among them state restaurants Separation of state and business functions 
Tax policy update Easier travel for Cubans Strategies for external debt restructuring and December 20, 2011 A new credit policy allowed Cuban banks to finance entrepreneurs and individuals wishing to make major purchases to do home improvements in addition to farmers. Cuban banks have long provided loans to farm cooperatives, they have offered credit to new recipients of farmland in usufruct since 2008 and in 2011 they began making loans to individuals for business and other purposes. The system of rationed food distribution known in Cuba was known as the Libreta de Abastecimiento supplies booklet". As of 2012 ration books at bodegas still procured rice, oil, sugar and matches, above government average wage £15 monthly. Raúl Castro signed Law 313 in September 2013 in order to create a special economic zone in the port city of Mariel, the first in the country. On the 22nd of October 2013 the dual currency system was set to be ended eventually. As of 2018, the dual currency was still being used in Cuba. Topic: Sectors. Topic: Energy production. As of 2011, 96% of electricity was produced from fossil fuels. Solar panels were introduced in some rural areas to reduce blackouts, brownouts and use of kerosene. Citizens were encouraged to swap inefficient lamps with newer models to reduce consumption. A power tariff reduced inefficient use as of August 2012. Offshore petroleum exploration of promising formations in the Gulf of Mexico had been unproductive with two failures reported. Additional exploration is planned. In 2007, Cuba produced an estimated 16.89 billion kilowatt hours of electricity and consumed 13.93 billion kilowatt hours with no exports or imports. In a 1998 estimate, 89.52% of its energy production is fossil fuel, 0.65% is hydroelectric, and 9.83% is other production. In both 2007 and 2008 estimates, the country produced 62,100 barrels d of oil and consumes 176,000 barrels d with 104,800 barrels d of imports, as well as 197,300,000 barrels proved reserves of oil. Venezuela is Cuba's primary source of oil. In 2008, Cuba produced and consumed an estimated 400 million cum of natural gas, with no cum of exports or imports and 70.79 billion cum of proved reserves. <inaudible> Energy sector The Energy Revolution is a program executed by Cuba in 2006. This program focused on developing the country's socio-economic status and transition Cuba into an energy-efficient economy with diverse energy resources. Cuba's energy sector lacks the resources to produce optimal amounts of power. In fact, one of the issues the Energy Revolution program faces comes from Cuba's power production suffering from the absence of investment and the ongoing trade sanctions imposed by the United States. Likewise, the energy sector has received a multi-million dollar investment distributed among a network of power resources. However, customers are experiencing rolling blackouts of power from energy companies in order to preserve electricity during Cuba's economic crisis. Furthermore, an outdated electricity grid that's been damaged by hard-hitting hurricanes, caused the energy crisis in 2004 and continued to be a major issue during the energy revolution. Cuba responded to this situation by providing a variety of different types of energy resources. 
In fact, 6,000 small diesel generators, 416 fuel oil generators, 893 diesel generators, 9.4 million incandescent bulbs for energy saving lamps, 1.33 million fans, 5.5 million electric pressure cookers, 3.4 million electric rice cookers, 0.2 million electric water pumps, 2.04 million domestic refrigerators, and 0.1 million televisions were distributed among territories. The electrical grid was restored to only 90% until 2009. Alternative energy has emerged as a major priority as the government has promoted wind and solar power. The crucial challenge the Energy Revolution program will face is developing sustainable energy in Cuba but take into account a country that's continuing to develop, an economic sanction and the detrimental effects of hurricanes that hit this country. topic agriculture Cuba produces sugarcane, tobacco, citrus, coffee, rice, potatoes, beans and livestock. As of 2015, Cuba imported about 70 to 80% of its food and 80 to 84% of the food it rations to the public. Raul Castro ridiculed the bureaucracy that shackled the agriculture sector. topic industry In total, industrial production accounted for almost 37% of Cuban GDP or 6.9 billion dollars and employed 24% of the population or 2,671,000 people in 1996. A rally in sugar prices in 2009 stimulated investment and development of sugar processing. In 2003 Cuba's biotechnology and pharmaceutical industry was gaining in importance. Among the products sold internationally are vaccines against various viral and bacterial pathogens. For example, the drug Hebeprit P was developed as a cure for diabetic foot ulcer and had success in many developing countries. Cuba has also done pioneering work on the development of drugs for cancer treatment. Scientists such as V. Vérez Bencomo were awarded international prizes for their contributions in biotechnology and sugar cane. Topic: Services. Topic: Tourism. In the mid-1990s tourism surpassed sugar, long the mainstay of the Cuban economy, as the primary source of foreign exchange. Havana devotes significant resources to building tourist facilities and renovating historic structures. Cuban officials estimate roughly 1.6 million tourists visited Cuba in 1999 yielding about $1.9 billion in gross revenues. In 2000, 1,773,986 foreign visitors arrived in Cuba. Revenue from tourism reached U.S. $1.7 billion. By 2012, some 3 million visitors brought nearly £2 billion yearly. The growth of tourism has had social and economic repercussions. This led to speculation of the emergence of a two-tier economy and the fostering of a state of tourist apartheid. This situation was exacerbated by the influx of dollars during the 1990s, potentially creating a dual economy based on the dollar the currency of tourists on the one hand and the peso on the other. Scarce imported goods, and even some of local manufacture, such as rum and coffee, could be had at dollar-only stores, but were hard to find or unavailable at peso prices. As a result, Cubans who earned only in the peso economy, outside the tourist sector, were at a disadvantage. Those with dollar incomes based upon the service industry began to live more comfortably. This widened the gulf between Cubans' material standards of living, in conflict with the Cuban government's long-term socialist policies. Retail Cuba has a small retail sector. 
A few large shopping centers operated in Havana as of September 2012 but charged U.S. prices. Pre-revolutionary commercial districts were largely shut down. The majority of stores are small dollar stores, bodegas, agro-mercados farmers markets and street stands. Finance The financial sector remains heavily regulated and access to credit for entrepreneurial activity is seriously impeded by the shallowness of the financial market. Foreign investment and trade The Netherlands receives the largest share of Cuban exports 24%, 70–80% of which go through Indiana Finance BV, a company owned by the Van T. Woot family, who have close personal ties with Fidel Castro. Currently, this trend can be seen in other colonial Caribbean communities who have direct political ties with the global economy. Cuba's primary import partner is Venezuela. The second largest trade partner is Canada, with a 22% share of the Cuban export market. Cuba began courting foreign investment in the special period. Foreign investors must form joint ventures with the Cuban government. The sole exception to this rule are Venezuelans, who are allowed to hold 100% ownership in businesses due to an agreement between Cuba and Venezuela. Cuban officials said in early 1998 that 332 joint ventures had begun. Many of these are loans or contracts for management, supplies, or services normally not considered equity investment in Western economies. Investors are constrained by the U.S. Cuban Liberty and Democratic Solidarity Act that provides sanctions for those who traffic in property expropriated from U.S. citizens. Cuba's average tariff rate is 10%. The country's planned economy deters foreign trade and investment. The state maintains strict capital and exchange controls. Currencies Cuba has two official currencies, both of which are called peso. One is sometimes called the national currency. Or cup, the other is the convertible peso or cook, often called dollar in the spoken language. There are currently 25 cup per cook. In 1994, the possession and use of U.S. dollars was legalized, and by 2004, the U.S. dollar was in widespread use in the country. To capture the hard currency flowing into the island through tourism and remittances, estimated at $500 minus $800 million annually, the government set up state-run dollar stores throughout Cuba that sold luxury food, household and clothing items, compared with basic necessities, which could be bought using national pesos. As such, the standard of living diverged between those who had access to dollars and those without. Jobs that could earn dollar salaries or tips from foreign businesses and tourists became highly desirable. It was common to meet doctors, engineers, scientists and other professionals working in restaurants or as taxicab drivers. However, in response to stricter economic sanctions by the U.S. and because the authorities were pleased with Cuba's economic recovery, the Cuban government decided in October 2004 to remove U.S. dollars from circulation. In its place, the convertible peso was created, which although not internationally traded, has a value pegged to the US dollar 1 to 1. A 10% surcharge is levied for cash conversions from US dollars to the convertible peso, which does not apply to other currencies, so it acts as an encouragement for tourists to bring currencies such as euros, pounds sterling or Canadian dollars into Cuba. An increasing number of tourist zones accept euros. topic private businesses owners of small private restaurants paladares originally could seat no more than 12 people and can only employ family members set monthly fees must be paid regardless of income earned and frequent inspections yield stiff fines when any of the many self-employment regulations are violated 
As of 2012, more than 150,000 farmers had signed up to lease land from the government for bonus crops. Before, home owners were only allowed to swap, once buying and selling were allowed, prices rose. In cities, urban agriculture farms small parcels. Growing organoponicos organic gardens in the private sector has been attractive to city-dwelling small producers who sell their products where they produce them, avoiding taxes and enjoying a measure of government help from the Ministry of Agriculture in the form of seed houses and advisors. Poverty Typical wages range from 400 non-convertible Cuban pesos a month, for a factory worker, to 700 per month for a doctor, or a range of around 17 to 30 US dollars per month. However, the Human Development Index of Cuba still ranks much higher than the vast majority of Latin American nations. After Cuba lost Soviet subsidies in 1991, malnutrition resulted in an outbreak of diseases. Despite this, the poverty level reported by the government is one of the lowest in the developing world, ranking sixth out of 108 countries, fourth in Latin America and 48th among all countries. Pensions are among the smallest in the Americas at $9.50 per month. In 2009, Raul Castro increased minimum pensions by $2, which he said was to recompense for those who have dedicated a great part of their lives to working and who remain firm in defense of socialism. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Public facilities. La Bodega, for Cuban nationals only. Redeems coupons for rice, sugar, oil, matches and sells other foodstuffs including rum. La Capellia, a government-owned facility offering ice cream, juice and sweets. Paladar, a type of small, privately owned restaurant facility. La Pharmacia, low-priced medicine, with the lowest costs anywhere in the world. ETECSA, National Telephone Service Provider. La Feria, a weekly market, Sunday market type, owned by the government. Serviceria Bucanero, a beverage manufacturer, providing both alcoholic and non-alcoholic beverages. Ciego Montero, the main soft drink and beverage distributor. Topic. Connection with Venezuela The relationship cultivated between Cuba and Venezuela in recent years resulted in agreements in which Venezuela provides cheap oil in exchange for Cuban «missions» a doctors to bolster the Venezuelan health care system. Cuba has the second highest per capita number of physicians in the world behind Italy. The country sends tens of thousands of doctors to other countries as aid, as well as to obtain favorable trade terms. In nominal terms, the Venezuelan subsidy is higher than whatever subsidy the Soviet Union gave to Cuba, with the Cuban state receiving cheap oil and the Cuban economy receiving around $6 billion annually. According to Mesa Lago, a Cuban-born U.S. economist, if this help stops, industry is paralyzed, transportation is paralyzed and you'll see the effects in everything from electricity to sugar mills." He said, from an economic standpoint, Cuba relies much more on Venezuela than Venezuela does on Cuba. As of 2012, Venezuela accounted for 20.8% of Cuba's GDP while Cuba only accounted for roughly 4% of Venezuela's. Because of this reliance, the most recent economic crisis in Venezuela 2012 present, with inflation nearing 800% and GDP shrinking by 19% in 2016, Cuba is not receiving their amount of payment and heavily subsidized oil. Further budget cuts are in the plans for 2018 marking a third straight year. Economic freedom. 
In 2014 Cuba's economic freedom score was 28.7, making its economy one of the world's least free. Its overall score was 0.2 point higher than last year, with deteriorations in trade freedom, fiscal freedom, monetary freedom and freedom from corruption counterbalanced by an improvement in business freedom. Cuba ranked least free of 29 countries in the South and Central America, Caribbean region and its overall score was significantly lower than the regional average. Over the 20-year history of the index, Cuba's economic freedom remained stagnant near the bottom of the repressed category. Its overall score improvement was less than one point over the past two decades, with score gains in fiscal freedom and freedom from corruption offset by double-digit declines in business freedom and investment freedom. Despite some progress in restructuring the state sector since 2010, the private sector remained constrained by heavy regulations and tight state controls. The Heritage Foundation states that open market policies were not in place to spur growth in trade and investment and the lack of competition continued to stifle dynamic economic expansion. A watered-down reform package endorsed by the party trimmed the number of state workers and expanded the list of approved professions, but many details of the reform remained obscure. Taxes and revenues As of 2009, Cuba had $47.08 billion in revenues and $50.34 billion in expenditures with 34.6% of GDP in public debt, an account balance of $513 million and $4.647 billion in reserves of foreign exchange and gold. Government spending is around 67% of GDP and public debt is around 35% of the domestic economy. Despite reforms, the government continues to play a large role in the economy. The top individual income tax rate is 50%. The top corporate tax rate is 30%, 35% for wholly foreign owned companies. Other taxes include a tax on property transfers and a sales tax. The overall tax burden is 24.4% of GDP. See also